House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to touch down in Taipei this morning. However, the Biden administration continues to struggle with articulating the president's policy on Taiwanese independence. Here's President Biden himself on the topic earlier this year. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are? That's the commitment we made. The idea that it can be taken by force, just taken by force, is just not, is just not appropriate. And now here's National Security Council Coordinator John Kirby speaking from the White House yesterday. We've repeatedly said that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We have said that we do not support Taiwan independence. And we have said that we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. According to the Washington Post, the White House has warned Chinese officials not to overreact to Pelosi's trip, with Kirby insisting the speaker's visit does not, quote, change the status quo. However, despite the White House's attempts to de-escalate, both the U.S. military and People's Liberation Army have deployed warships near the Taiwan Strait. Joining us now to weigh in is Dave DeCamp. He's a news editor for Antiwar.com and host of Antiwar News with Dave DeCamp. Welcome to Rising, Dave. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're having a very uh, heavy foreign policy uh, foreign policy day here on Rising. You know, give us your perspective on this trip from Nancy Pelosi uh, to Taiwan and how China might react. Yeah, well, you know, we've seen since the reports came out that Pelosi was planning to make this trip. We've seen all these reports that the Biden administration uh, fears that it could provoke a cross-strait crisis. We've seen Biden say that the U.S. military thinks it's not a good idea. From Beijing's view, it's a provocation. Uh, we've seen U.S. officials say they will view it as a purposeful provocation. And to me, that's all it is. I don't understand what Nancy Pelosi could possibly accomplish in Taiwan that is worth risking provoking China. Um, and now you saw John Kirby say that the U.S. doesn't support Taiwan's independence, which is that's been U.S. policy since the 1970s, officially since 1979. We've seen some media kind of say that the Biden administration is caving to China because they don't support Taiwan independence, but that's U.S. policy. Now, what he also said is that they don't support any change of the status quo across the Taiwan Strait, but that's exactly what the U.S. has been doing over the past few years, starting under the Trump administration. Uh, we saw high-level U.S. officials start visiting the island more frequently, we saw more U.S. warships and warplanes deployed to the South China Sea and near Taiwan. We've seen a lot of informal ties growing, and they could say that as much as they want that, that, and blame it all on China, but it really is uh, a policy that the U.S. Has, has started following over the past few years. Dave, yeah, there really does seem to be an inconsistency here between Nancy Pelosi's hate behavior and the messaging that's now coming out of the White House and also the kind of military repositioning in the area. I was reading some coverage of this, and they describe Nancy Pelosi's trip as, you know, a lark that could not be stopped. You know, the phrase that's something like, you know, there's nothing the White House can do if Nancy Pelosi decides to make it a trip. <laughs> and that strikes me as a strange admission as to the weakness <laughs> of the White House, the lack of, you know, uh, communication that's happening within the White House or the utter disregard or respect that Nancy Pelosi has for Biden, or in the alternative, that it's a little bit of a fiction that she is doing this so independently. What do you make of that tension? Yeah, it's kind of hard for me to believe that if the Biden administration really didn't want Pelosi to go because of all these risks that they, they I, I believe that they could have pressured her not to go, or Biden could have, as commander in chief, ordered some aircraft carriers out of the region and shown that they weren't gonna support the trip. You know, because we saw those reports, but then again, we saw John Kirby say yesterday that, you know, she has the right to go to Taiwan and that the Chinese have no right to stop her. Um, so it does seem, and it falls in line with the Biden administration's China policy, which has been very hawkish uh, following the Trump administration. Um, again, we've seen congressional delegations. Maybe their line is that they can't stop these congressional delegations, but the last one that we saw was in early July, Senator Rick Scott visited Taiwan and we saw China fly warplanes over the median line, which divides the Taiwan Strait. And I read a report in the South China Morning Post this morning quoting Chinese analysts and people close to the Chinese military. They think that uh, 
that's a likely response that we're going to see today is these Chinese warplanes going over that median line, which typically doesn't happen. And they think that now after this trip, things are going to change and it's going to happen more often. And we've seen an increase in uh, Chinese, the Chinese military's warplanes flying into what they call an air defense identification zone near Taiwan. It's not Taiwanese airspace. It's a different concept. I, don't, I can't really get into that, but mm -hmm. <laughs> they usually don't fly very close to the island of Taiwan. But that started happening at, regularly after August 2020 when President Trump sent Alex Azar to Taiwan. That was he was his health secretary. That was the highest level cabinet official to visit Taiwan since 1979. The, the following month in September 2020, they sent Keith Crack. He was the undersecretary for economics in the State Department, and he was the highest level State Department official to visit Taiwan since 1979. So these are unprecedented steps. And since then, we've seen more Chinese military activity in the region. It seems especially stupid, the timing of it, this escalation, given that it's entirely chosen by the Biden administration, or not even the Biden administration, just by House Speaker Pelosi, uh, given what everything that uh, the Biden administration is trying to accomplish in Ukraine, the, the continued uh, funding of the war effort there, uh, Biden has made very public statements about spending money doing whatever it takes to defend Ukraine from Russia. So why then, and you know, you can have whatever opinion you have on that kind of decision anyway, but let's say we're doing that, what sense does it make to escalate tensions with China while we're presumably hoping that China is not getting overly close to Russia or being pushed in a Russian direction while we're trying to deal with this other it, it, it feels like an utterly chosen escalation at the worst possible time. I think that's it, it, that's what it seems like to me. I really just can't understand it unless they're trying to provoke a reaction from China. Because if you read, you know, the Pentagon, uh, the Biden administration, they put out all these strategy documents about countering China in what they call the Indo-Pacific now. And they want to really expand their military footprint in the region. So maybe they're looking for a reaction, a big reaction from China to say, hey, see, we have to go over there. And it's kind of this sick cycle where China r responds to the U.S. Uh, doing something. And then that's justification for m more U.S. military assets in the region and ramping up tensions with China. But I think after this, you know, this might be uh, kind of a point of no return. It, it might really send U.S.-China relations really down into the toilet. I mean, they've been really bad in the past few years, but this to me just is completely unnecessary. And, you know, yesterday there was a non-proliferation conference in New York, the non-proliferation treaty, and U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he said humanity right now is one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. Him and other officials have said that we're at a higher risk of nuclear war now than any time during the Cold War because of the war in Ukraine, because the U.S. is funding a war on Russia's border built to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. And now we go ahead and stoke tensions with China. I mean, to me, it's completely uh, reckless and it needs to stop. But unfortunately, it seems like it's there's a pretty major bipartisan consensus for all this uh, madness. Hmm. Well, in a new op-ed, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman called Pelosi's visit, quote, utterly reckless, dangerous, and irresponsible. In light of the U.S.'s current conflict with Russia, writing, quote, in short, this Ukraine war is so not over, so not stable, so not without dangerous surprises that can pop out at any given day. Yet in the middle of all of this, we are going to risk a conflict with China over Taiwan, provoked by an arbitrary and frivolous visit by the Speaker of the House. So it just feels like there's no strategy here. I, I struggle to identify what the Biden administration's foreign policy even is, because on one hand, you have the pullout from Afghanistan, but then you immediately have a commitment to defend Ukraine at all costs. And now you have escalation with China, not even, I guess, being chosen again by Biden. It's so weird that Pelosi, and it's weird and just cannot be explained, Pelosi doing this on her own and kind of being, it, like, it sounds like they're unhappy with her doing it, but if they're really unhappy, they can obviously stop her. Yeah. I mean, although, Dave, you did, you were saying that there has been an escalation even through the Trump administration of sending increasingly senior officials to Taiwan. I mean, is this a broader kind of foreign po uh, blob of foreign policy decision that is not partisan and, you know, that has been building for many years? 
Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, you know, we saw in the 2018 national defense strategy that the Pentagon put out during the Trump years, that outlined the shift away from counterterrorism called uh, towards this so-called great power competition with Russia and China. And since then, we've seen kind of a drawdown from the Middle East. We're still very involved there, but all the drone wars that Trump ramped up, he kind of decreased at the end of his administration. And then we saw the Afghanistan withdrawal. Um, and now this is just the strategy, the overall strategy, the direction that uh, the establishment or the blob, whatever you want to call it, wants to go. If you, you look at all the really hawkish think tanks in Washington that are funded by the arms industry, uh, it's all about uh, this so-called great power competition with Russia right now seems to be the more imminent you know, uh, issue, I guess. But China seems to be in the long run. And we've seen this from just about every U.S. government agency, the Pentagon, the FBI, the State Department, CIA, say that China is the long-term uh, so-called threat. And we've seen Biden say this, and this is kind of the name of the game in Washington right now. And we even see this in some Repub Republican opposition to funding the war in Ukraine. We saw Josh Hawley, he wrote an op-ed in the National Interest the other day explaining why he's not going to vote to expand NATO into Finland and Sweden. And his reasoning was because we have to expand our military in the Asia Pacific. So that's kind of even those against the Ukraine policy seem to agree on the on the China issue. Hmm. Well, Dave DeCamp, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. We'll be back with more Rising right after this.